Y'all ready? Here we go. Let's talk about Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of all free. The great I am, the true, the life. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. Let's talk about Jesus. Brother Bill, if you don't mind, open us up in prayer tonight, please. Okay, Sunday night, back in the house of God with the Word of God and God's people. The only thing that gets any better than that, it'd be ruptured or raptured. Either one will work. Amen. 
looking for him to come or us to go. So, how many are just happy you're saved? How many are just, yeah, there's got to be a couple, I know there's a few of them around here like that, they you come in the door and like you've been baptized in lemon juice or something, so, I, by the way, the world will do that to you, amen, the world will do that to you, and you come in the door though, at least you're surrounded by the people of God that love you and pray for you, but it's good to have you back tonight, I pray that God will encourage you and that the Word of God will have have total effect and we're going to ask our guys to come and receive the offering and get right on into the service so miss jan i'll let you get away too quickly that's all right don't worry about it yeah she got it. all right she got it she's got it going right now all right all right brother silas if you would please pray for us well, we're starting a new study under the same author. How about that? John, the beloved apostle, that apostle of love he's been called. And the scripture itself calls John the apostle that Jesus loved. And, um, you know, never does John define himself or acknowledge himself as Paul. Paul would say Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ in, in his introduction. But John, in none of his writings, ever discloses his personality, who he is. We just have to gather the information from the writing, and we know that uh, John was the author of John the Gospel, and of course he's the author of, of First, Second, Third John, and the book of the Revelation. And a lot of these writings took place, well in fact this writing took place somewhere around 90 A.D. Uh, in that basic era, and knowing that John was getting up in age, in fact, uh, we're only guessing about his age, but what we understand, he was about the same age of Christ. Um, so that would mean that it's been 60 years since the church has uh, was born, approximately 60 years. And so John was somewhere in the 90s when he wrote all of these writings, and he ministered to the church. And actually, from what we can understand, he actually was living in, uh, in, the, Ep in the Ephesus area and the, in Asia, and he carried on a tremendous amount of missionary work there, evangelistical work, reaching people with the gospel of Christ. And it was said that a lot of times John would walk into a, a congregation and sit down in the back. He didn't want, to, uh, didn't want to be noticed or recognized. And if some people, if some of the speakers were to recognize him and they say, Brother John, do you have a word of exhortation or encouragement? He'd always say, this is tradition. We can't prove this, but it's said he'd always say these two things. My brother and I would that you'd pray one for another that you love one another. I can't think of any two things more important for Christians to do than to pray for each other and to love each other. Amen. So we're here in the gospel. After the gospel, as, as I mentioned this morning, as John's writing in the gospel was a demonstration of the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who Jesus was, who he is, who he forever shall be, John declared him to be in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among men, John said, declaring the deity of Jesus Christ, which is under extreme attack right now, but it was then. Gnostics, the Gnosticism was one of the great enemies in the New Testament era. And, of course, John was no different. In fact, this writing has a great deal to do with refuting Gnosticism. Gnosticism taught that all, anything material was evil. And so therefore, Jesus or God could not be man and God simultaneously because the material part of the fleshly part would have to be evil. So he couldn't be God. So they denied this dualism and also believed that anything you did in the flesh didn't matter. You could sin all you wanted to but in the flesh because it didn't mean anything. It was evil anyway. Well, of course, you and I know, and, and John's going to be refuting a great deal of that, but the primary reason this gospel or this messages were written, especially in First John, was to proclaim the fundamentals of basic Christianity. Just the fundamental. In fact, uh, one author said that John was like, let's get back to the basics. Well, I think we need to get back to the basics. My goodness, haven't we left them far behind? Uh, and sometimes in the name of intellectualism, we're supposed to move, move away from some of the... Um, the, the old old phrases, but I, I want to say something to you. I don't think you can get any better than staying with the Word of God wherever it carries you. 
and it carries you to a place of stability. And that's where we're going to begin tonight in chapter 1, verse 1. Let's start there by just gazing into the Word of God, reading a few verses and stopping and making some comments through it. Uh, by the way, as you well know, all of you that have been here any length of time, I believe that I believe in exegetical preaching, expositional preaching, whichever you prefer to call it, verse by verse, precept upon precept, it's almost impossible to get away from the truth if you stay in context. But it's pretty easy to get away from the truth if you do topical preaching because you're trying to find something to back up your topic rather than letting the Bible say what it says and then agreeing with what it says. So that's the principle that I've used for years and will continue to, starting in John. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. And you'll notice something unusual right off the bat. It's just like slap in your face. Have you noticed that he starts this sentence off and he uses a very unusual method? Let's read verse 1 and you'll see what I mean. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. And then there's a parenthetical statement between verse 1 and verse 3. For the life was manifested and we've seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Now, that's the parenthetical statement. Then we get to verse 3 where he says, Now that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Now, I want to stop there just for a minute. Have you ever noticed that John spoke of, in verse 1, he spoke of that which was from the beginning. And recognize he's not talking about a thing, is he? He uses the term that. He didn't say he. He didn't say them, defining the Godhead. He used a phrase which would automatically catch the reader's attention by using an almost declarative and undefining statement because what he was doing is showing that using that term, the term that which instead of he which, that he was going to combine the flesh, and the Spirit, proving that Jesus was, in fact, God and man. In fact, the dualism battle that was going on uh, with, the, with the Gnostics. And using that term, it's almost like he was causing, calling Jesus, or the, the Word and those things, an inanimate object. That wasn't, of course, that wasn't his desire. His design was to catch the attention of those that were listening to some of the Gnostics' teaching and letting them realize that he used the term that which was from the beginning, that, o that can only be deity. And they recognize that he uses the term that which was from the beginning and not he which was from the beginning. We're speaking of the spiritual sense of who Jesus was. And then he said, well, wait a minute. We have heard, we have heard him, heard that, and which we have seen with our eyes. Now, it's kind of hard to see a spiritual that with your eyes, is it not? Now he's bringing in the dualism. You see the play on words. And he says, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon. And by the way, the difference between seeing with your eyes and look upon, as you might notice, actually, they, uh, having seen with our eyes is what's called in a perfect, perfect perfect indicative phrase and it literally means it's passed with a continued action we have seen and we continue to see that means he's self-existent that means he's he's always who he's going to be and doesn't change and of course he says we have seen with our eyes in which we have looked upon and that's in the aorist middle tense it means it's an act it's, it's something that's been said and it doesn't need to follow the middle voice is kind of hard in the greek to to follow when it's used but it says, we have seen with our eyes and we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Now, here's what he said. I want you to, I want to, it sounds confusing to start with, but I want you to listen to me. Here's what he was doing. He was using a complex statement that was made up of not personal. It, he didn't say he that we've seen. He was using and mixing the two together, the spiritual and the material Proving that Jesus was not only God in the Spirit, He was God in the flesh. Because He said, we've handled Him. 
And the word handle there, I was, I was looking at it because it's such an unusual thing. It means to verify by contact. That means we, we know he's real. We put our hands on him. How do you like that? Don't you just, John's just such a practical preacher. He, but he's doing the very thing that we need to understand. Because remember, the deity of Jesus Christ is under attack. And especially the God, the God man part where he's God man, God and man. And, of course, we could say, well, he could not be man because man is sinful in nature. Well, not this man because this man wasn't born under the blood, through the blood of Adam. He was born of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost gave him flesh uh, through Mary, that, that wonderful little 16-year-old, we think, virgin Mary that was birthed this man called Jesus. And actually, John says quickly, he's God. And he's man, 100% God, 100% man. And so what we have now is we have, we have this thing that the Gnostics are going to have to deal with after John dropped the bomb on them to begin with. So he opened the door, and now he's beginning to continue the thought pattern of who this Jesus is. That's why the parenthetical statement, he said, for, and he's still using the definite article there, the life was manifested. That means, how can you manifest life unless it's manifested in a body? You can't see life unless it's in something that's alive. Amen? Are y'all with me out there? I didn't lose anybody, did I? I hope not. But understanding that this life, you could actually see. You could feel. You could touch. The word manifest means it was made visible. And so he said the life, the life, was manifested, and we've seen it. Again, you can't see life unless it's in someone that's living. And then he makes a statement, he says, And we bear witness and show unto you that eternal life. Not only have we seen it, we want you to see it. How can you see eternal life? Well, you see the person that is eternal life. Because Jesus wasn't only God in that one sense. He was eternal God. A God that never changes. And also the only one that could give us eternal life. And by the way, eternity has no what? end and also doesn't have a beginning i've said this over and over and some of you look like i uh, stare at me like a deer looking at headlights sometime but but remember eternity is open on both ends it has no beginning and no ending because the life our life our eternal life is we are brought into his life and we're living his life not he didn't just extend thank god he didn't just extend our life eternally wouldn't you hate to have to live in this mess on your own life throughout eternity So he makes it plain, he says, And we show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested again, made visible to us. By the way, he was using using the verification of all the apostles, not just himself. He said, well, I wasn't the only one that saw him. I wasn't the only one that handled him. I wasn't the only one that that heard him. Uh, There were the us involved, more than one witness. He realized that under Jewish conditions and and jewish law there had to be at least two possibly three witnesses and of course they were they were 11 even 12 if you want to count judas iscariot but then verse 3 picks up the subject matter between the parenthetical let's read verse 1 and read verse 3 and we'll leave the parenthetical statement out of it okay that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life that verse 3 that which we have seen and heard Declare we unto you that you also may have, look at this word, fellowship. We've used that word over and over. The definition is so important. It means celebrating a oneness. It's the word that we get, we get our word communion from. It's on this one. We come to the Father's table and celebrate the Lord's Supper. We celebrate our oneness with God. That's the word. It comes from the Greek word koinia which means oneness with God, in essence, without just giving you the transliteration of it. But he says, we declare unto you that you may have fellowship with us. The same kind of relationship with us that that we have one with another. Now he's speaking about this human relationship in sharing that relationship that they already have with Christ. And truly, our fellowship, what we want to share with you, is the fellowship we've gotten from our Father. And now he makes a declarative statement. And his son, Jesus Christ. Now he defines the that. The declaration is out. No more wondering who the that and the the and the it was. Now the declaration is clear. It's this man that all this, that has stirred up all this, this 
different, different philosophies and different in teaching and erroneous teaching of who Christ was. And so he's established the eternity of God, the humanity of God, and the deity of Jesus Christ within three short statements. Uh, to me, that's out, outstanding. He said in three sentences what it would take many of us, what it's already taken me a half a night to say. But he said something that we don't want to miss. If you miss who Jesus is, nothing else spiritually matters in your life. Because there's nothing out there that is spiritually good except through Jesus Christ. There is other spiritual things out there, but none that are good, all that are bad. So the declaration has been made. Jesus is the Son of God. And He's also God the Son. That's the declaration. And this is what bothered, and by the way, still bothers the cults. This is what the Mormons have problems with. This is what the Jehovah's Witnesses have problems with, is they determine to make Jesus a God, the Mormons, and of course then the Jehovah's Witness, they want to make Him just uh, one of, also one of many gods, and not the God. And no, the definite article is there in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was the God is there, and He's always going to be the God. Now, verse 4, He says, Now, there's a reason that we're writing these things, and the reason He's spending so much time building His, his premise behind the whole thought is understanding who Jesus is. From And only by revelation can we understand who He is. What, I, what do I mean by that? Any manner of intellect cannot figure God out. Any matter of, of smarts, as we use the old word, can never get from where you are to where you need to be spiritually. Only you can't, you and I can't move toward God until God moves toward us. And so we're understanding now why it was so important to build the doctrine of the deity of Jesus Christ and the humanity of Jesus Christ into one person so that we approach one person as we're drawn to Him. And so now He said, I want to give you the reason I'm telling you this. Look at verse 4. And these things write we unto you. Why? That your joy... Your what? Well, where does joy come from? It comes straight from the fountain of God. Oh, by the way, there's a big difference in joy and happiness. Joy is not conditional. Remember, the joy of the Lord, the author says is my what? Strength. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Rejoice how? In the Lord. And that kind of rejoicing cannot be stifled because it doesn't change with the every wave of life. When you get up in the morning and go and stump your toe, that doesn't feel joyful, but it doesn't change your joy. It's the same. It's static. It should be. And so that's why he's writing this whole series of things that he said so far. I want your joy. What does he mean by being full? Literally, it simply means this. Unstoppable. Unstoppable. It means a level that cannot be changed. Why? Well, if your joy is in Jesus Christ, does He change? So how can your joy change? Our joy cannot change if it's in Christ. Now, if it's in the things of Christ, what He does for us or what He gives to us, that can change. Because what He gives can change, but He can't. So He's saying, we're declaring to you who He is so that you'll have your joy in the right place. And folks, no wonder we see so many sad Christians that they've forgotten that it's not what God's doing in your life that matters. It's who's in your life that matters. That stabilizes. That centers around what's going on. By the way, I don't know any Christians that haven't had some tough times. I don't. I really don't. I don't. I can't. I, the other day, I was trying to think: Do I know anybody that has just had a smooth sail ever since they've been, <laughs> been saved? I know some people that had some pretty smooth sailing up till they got saved, and then it looked like the world caved in. Amen. What happens? Well, I see. Until you trust Christ, there's no spiritual battles going on. You've got one. Master, and that's you. And the enemy is controlling you by your own fleshly desires. Whatever, where did we get the saying? If it feels good, do what? Do it. 
Well, I got to tell you, some stuff that feels good can get you in more trouble than you can get out of. And that's what the flesh does. But knowing Christ and, and having, having the revelation of who He is living in your life, all of a sudden, if, if my, my daddy used to have a saying, he had, I didn't realize how wise my father was until he'd already gone on to be with the Lord. But he had a saying, an old country saying, that I remember syrup was, I call it syrup. Some of y'all call it syrup, but you'll get over yourself. It's syrup. That's what it is, amen. And biscuits, you know, cat heads, as daddy called them. And he was talking about, somebody was telling him one day, well, you know, Ed, the syrup's going up. And Dad said, well, I don't care if syrup goes to a dollar a sop. I just quit sopping. That's a pretty good idea, amen. It doesn't matter if things change. It matters how you react to change. That's what he was saying. And what John has given us here, the reason that our joy, the level should never change. Full means it can't get any better. Also means it can't get any less. If our joy is in the message and the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message. This is what he's brought us to. This wonderful understanding. We now know who Jesus is. We know Jesus is God and he's man. The declaration is he sees him, he's heard him, he's handled him with his hands, and he is in fact the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He's already made the declaration. Now in verse 5. This then is the message which we've heard of him. And we don't want to declare it, preach it, proclaim it. That's the word to you that God is what? Light. Light. By the way, metaphorical changes here. John was absolutely wonderful using light and darkness and contrast in one with the other. Light usually speaks of purity and holiness and goodness and godliness. Darkness, in fact, is the exact opposite. So he uses these two, contrasting one to another. And he says, this is the message which we've heard of him. And we declare unto you, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Are you getting the picture? John wanted to make sure. He just said, no, there wasn't any darkness in him. That wasn't good enough. He wanted the definitive, absolute impossibility for anybody to think there was even a shade of darkness in God. You know what he was saying? God is absolutely perfect. No sin in God. There's no darkness in Him. And the, that's the message. The message is He's all good. He's all holy. And by the way, we have to be holy as He is holy in order to see God. How do we become that? He's already made the declaration, but let's get the rest of it. If Now He's going to give us three actually false appeals. That, and notice the phrase, if we say. How many know that everything we say is not always correct? Have you ever said anything and you knew it was wrong? When you said, well, we won't go into that. Uh, but these guys are making professions here, and he's, he's reminding us that these three can be false appeals. Listen to the first one. If we say we have fellowship or oneness with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and we don't do that. Or there's don't do the truth. We do not the truth. In other words, he's saying, if there's no darkness in, at all in God, and you are in Him, or we have that oneness with Him, and yet you walk in darkness, and you're bringing darkness into light. By the way, recently, I, I need to come back and, and apologize to you guys. They have proven, and I've said for years that there was no such thing as darkness, just the absence of light. Well, now they've proven that darkness is a thing. It's a substance. Would you believe that? I had to go back and correct my preaching all these years. I think I'll just keep preaching it and let them worry about figuring it out. I <laughs> said, one thing I do know, they do declare now there is darkness. And what he's talking about here, if we say that we are we in fellowship with God, we're one with God, and yet we're walking absolutely, totally contrary to what God is and who God is, and we bring that darkness into the light and it begins to be shaded. Therefore, God would take on a different tent and He says, that can't happen. You're just lying. Amen? You don't do the truth. John would not build a big congregation telling his people, you're lying. If you say that, well, it's the truth. We say one thing and we're another. So he says in verse, verse 6, if we, have, if we say we have fellowship, we lie and do not the truth. Then in verse 7, he says, but, I always like this. He gives you an opportunity to change what you say into what you do. Now listen to the statement. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, 
Then we have fellowship or koinonia, oneness. One with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses. And by the way, this is in the Aorist tense, which simply means He not only cleanses, He continues to cleanse. Have you ever thought about this? You've been forgiven. You got saved. Every one of your sins were forgiven. And within 30 minutes, you're sinning again. Amen? Or well, let's hopefully not 30 minutes, maybe 35, something like that. You've had a bad th- Something could happen. Here's the thing you need to know. And we're going to find it in verse 9. God's manner of keeping us totally, wholly clean, spiritually speaking, is the first thing you have to make note of is no matter how dark the darkness is, it cannot change pure light. Light's going to always be pure light. Can't change that. Light will always push darkness away. If you bring darkness into this room and there's light, guess what? You'll never know darkness is here. Amen? The lights are on. If you turn the lights off and darkness comes in, guess what happens when you turn the lights on? Darkness has to disappear. So here's what he's saying. In order to walk in cleanliness, in order to walk in the light, and if we actually walk in the light as he is in the light, in the same same way Jesus walked at doing constantly the will of the Father. And then he says, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now we quit talking and started walking. There's the difference. What we say we are and what we really are may be two different things. You know what Paul, Paul, Jesus used this word. It was a word from an actor's where uh, people on the stage used. It was, uh, it was a word hypocrite. It means behind the mask. Remember the actors in those days wore false masks uh, to portray a, another individual. So Jesus said if you take the mask off, and that's what he was doing. His words took the mask off of the hypocrites. And the people that he called hypocrites were people who said one thing and did another. And so that's what John is using here again, using the same idea. And he says, you can say this, but if you do this, this makes the difference. And he says in verse 8, if we say, now just in case there's somebody that says, hey, look, I don't have any sin. I don't need to be saved. Have you ever, I ran into this guy once, I'll never forget him. He said, what do I need? I told him, I said, look, have you ever been saved? He said, what do I need to be saved? I said, well, let me ask you. Why would you not need to be saved? He said, well, what do I need to be saved from? I said, you need to be saved from your sins. Oh, I, have, I don't sin. I said, you don't lie much either, do you? Sin is a part of the natural life. It comes along with the territory. The only thing you have to do to be a sinner is breathe. And if you're breathing, you qualify. And they were saying, John was using this, you say you have no sin, then we deceive ourselves. He didn't be so kind. He didn't say, you rascal, you're deceiving yourself. He said, we. If we say that, then we deceive ourselves. And again, the truth is not in us. I believe he's using this in in a roundabout way and saying, we can tell if the real truth, the truth, Jesus Christ, lives in you. Because it won't let you lie and get by. You'll have to uh, admit to the truth. So he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Two cases he's already said, if you do this, the truth is isn't in you. Verse 9. Now he reaches the point. But, I'm using that word. He doesn't use the word but. If we confess. Let's stop on that word a minute. The word confess means to agree with God. Whatever God says sin is, you have to agree with Him that God, yes, what I just did, I see it exactly like you see it, is sin. You and I can never get forgiveness of a sin unless we confess it. It's got to be confessed. Now, this is what scares me. I find people today that feel like they don't really need to confess their sins. Years ago, there was a thing in the church, we called them altars, but the old, the old Puritans called them mourning benches. What they were is a place where sinners came and wept before God for their sins. And 
I, I, I'm of the opinion, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but most people today doesn't act like sin bothers them very much. Does sin bother y'all? Well, I hope you're not going to sit there and say, oh, no, you wouldn't be in church if it <laughs> didn't bother you some. Well, let me ask you, does it, do you find yourself ever trying to justify your sin? Now, remember, we're in church. Okay? Ever find yourself saying, well, God, everybody does that, or I, I, you know, I slipped up a little bit or whatever. Listen, here's what 1 John 1, 9 says, and it's based on this fact. If we agree with God that what we've done is sin and we see it the same way God sees it, if we confess that sin, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from what? All all the unrighteousness we've confessed. And the, the idea in verse 9, the first few words gives it, lends it to this idea. Confession, from God's point of view, is not only saying, God, I sinned. It also requires repentance. God, forgive me and help me not to do it again. How many have ever went and prayed and said, God, forgive me for this sin, and it wouldn't be no time you'd have done the same thing again? Say yes. I, I know it happens. Most, well, listen, the enemy would like to tell you, well, listen, you already got, there's no need in going back and asking God to forgive this. You've already asked God to forgive you. Why don't you just ask God to forgive all your sins? Because that's not what he said. He, you asked God to forgive you of all your sins when you got saved. This is written to Christians. Remember, John includes himself when he says, if we. So he was included himself as a Christian. If a Christian has, who has already been saved goes to God and says, God, I just lied. You saw me lie, God. I see that as a, as a sin against you, and I ask you to forgive me and give me the strength, God, not to ever do it again. In Jesus' name, forgive me. God forgives that. He never holds that sin against you again until you sin again. Here's the danger. If you don't confess it, you only leave God one, one, absent, one, one option. He's got to judge it in your life. And that's why he sent Jesus to the cross to die for us so that he wouldn't have to constantly judge us of our sins, not only of our eternal sins, but the sins that breaks the fellowship that we have. And by the way, if you love your fellowship with God, one of the worst things in the world to do is sin, 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 and never make it right with God. Let me tell you what will happen. It'll get to where that sin won't bother you. If you walk into a dark room and you stay in that room long enough, you can get to where you can see in the dark. And I believe if we let sin, our, our conscience gets to where it's seared. The Bible talks about a seared conscience, seared with a hot iron. When we continue to sin and sin the same sin and don't go to God and get it straightened out with God, then we get to where we think, okay, God's not going to bother me. But I want to tell you the time will come. God will knock on your door and it will be judgment time. It will happen because you're his child. And you know what he does? If you had a good parent, when you, were, when you were caught in the act of doing wrong, they corrected you. Amen? However they did. My daddy didn't believe in spanking. I'm so glad. He believed in whooping. You ever had a couple of them old-fashioned whoopings? You didn't need but one or two of those a year. They, they, they straighten you up. So John says... If we say we have not sinned, then we make ourselves a liar. The truth is not in us. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we make ourselves liars. But if we confess our sins as believers now, and we confess them and agree with God that it is sin, repent of the sin, then what happens? God forgives us, cleans us up. And by the way, it's as if you never sinned. Now, doesn't that, isn't that joyful? It says, if you never sinned. Boy, that just... Mm. Verse 10, we'll get to the last one, we'll close. If we say that we have not sinned, um, there are people who believe in sinless perfection. Did you know that? People that believe that once they got saved, they've never sinned again. <laughs> uh, you know what? I hate, to, I hate to bust their bubble, but they're absolutely wrong. 
the only time that we won't sin. And by the way, you do know that we don't have to sin. Romans 6 makes it plain. Sin's got no more dominion over us. But also we know as long as we're living in this earthly body with all the temptations and the desires that this body has, I promise you we're going to constantly need to come to the throne of grace and say, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. I've said something wrong. I've thought something wrong. I've done something wrong. God, please forgive me. And I promise you, the goodness of God says that He'll be there to forgive you. But if we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. And His Word, small w, is not operating in our lives. Now, what does He mean by that? It means that the Word of God is what brings conviction. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God to bring conviction. And when God says it's wrong, it's wrong. It doesn't matter how we feel about it. How many times have you went through the Bible and God would say, this is wrong and you just wish it wasn't that way? Come on, don't lie about it. I mean, there's certain things you want to do and you just, boy, I wish God hadn't put that in there. I, I, I'm glad God put what he put in there because I know it's for my good and yours too. And that's the only reason that we have it in the Word of God. So John has made his declaration. Jesus is in fact deity. He also is what brought a, had he not been God in the flesh, he could not have paid God's sin debt, and we would not have salvation if Jesus Christ wasn't born of a virgin. He had to be perfect. He could not have sin, and yet he had to be human at the same time. Isn't that a marvelous truth? Somebody say amen. Anybody have a question? Well, y'all got it all. I like that. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am, and that's sad because, you know, say, oh, I just slipped up. I didn't sin. God didn't say confess your slip-ups. He said confess your sins. Amen? And by the way, let me tell you that trying to make sin prettier than it is is dangerous because you'll begin to think that that sin's okay. It's not really that. It's just a little slip-up. I mean, I just lied a little bit. We even color lies now, you know, black, white, blue, and purple all kind of lie it's a lie a lie is a lie no matter what it is so i hope you're beginning to get the drift of where john cares i'm excited about where he's going with this and i hope you hold on because remember he says i'm giving you this message so that you're i want you to leave here when we get through with first john second john and third john i want you to leave here with your joy tank full some of you look like i missed the mark tonight well anyway hopefully not so okay all right. Brother Gene Rutledge, pray for us, my brother.